Secret Origins Podcast, episode 25. Welcome to the once and final episode 25 of the Secret Origins Podcast. See what I did there? See what I did there? <laughs> uh, we now have gone unlimited, or we've been going unlimited. I'm your host, Steve, Joe, and Mike, and joining me is Lupus Convoy. Hello, sir. Hello. How are you? Sad. This is our last episode. Yes, this is the last episode. Uh, and I had, to, I had to work a once and future thing joke in there. <laughs> Uh, and as as Lupus just said, today we'll be recapping Justice League Season 5 and final overall thoughts on the entire series. Um, 25 episodes, it's taken us a year to do this. The final episode will be hitting uh, the airwaves uh, February 2nd, 2011. Uh, I, I forget... Which way it is, if if that dumb bastard Puxatani sees his shadow, it's six more weeks. If he doesn't see it, it's early spring. Whichever it is, I hope to God it's early spring, because I am tired of fucking looking at white shit. I think it's still going to happen if you like it or not. Sorry. God, son of a bitch. Stupid fucking groundhog. <laughs> hey, it's a tr- I don't think you can really blame the groundhog for this. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, and we ha- and we are you streaming this episode of the Secret Origins podcast, and I don't know why. One of our you stream uh, viewers says that he does not like Batman Beyond. What the hell is wrong with you, Scotty? Do he's not Scotty? Don't. Yeah. I'm gonna stick scrappy on you unless you start watching Batman Beyond. Dude, nobody deserves that. No one deserves the scrappy do. <laughs> well, no one deserves the Scooby Dumb, but everyone deserves the scrappy do. No one deserves the scrappy do. No one deserves scrappy do. <laughs> Hitler did not deserve scrappy do. <laughs> Yes, and another one of our our, our Ustream watchers, uh, Mr. Glade Packer over there, is like, oh, gods, because he knows exactly what argument I'm bringing up. <laughs> Pee-wee's Playhouse, oh, God, that is not entertainment. But anyway, uh, yeah, so basically episode uh, 25 here will have two parts. It'll have the season five overall thoughts and favorite moments and stuff like that, and then we're going to go through the entire series and have an overall discussion on the actual Justice League, Justice League Unlimited series. And I've said from day one of this podcast that I do not look at these shows individually. They Justice League Unlimited is a rebranded version of Justice League. Yes, they changed the format. Yes, they changed the intro and the outro theme song, which I love that they changed it. But... It is one show. They are not two separate shows. So that's why throughout all 25 episodes of the Secret Origins podcast, I have just called it Justice League Season 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, I, I just I, I don't see them as individual shows because they're not. They are one show. I tried looking up uh, Justice League Unlimited on IMDb. It pulled up the Justice League thing. And, it, and under the Justice League thing on IMDb, and we all know how well-versed IMDb is, but, you know, under Justice League, it lists all five seasons as its one show. So that's that's just the way I look at it. Um, 
What have you been up to, Lupus? Uh, up there in New Hampshire, you you guys have a lot of snow as well, don't you? <laughs> yes, but in New Hampshire, we go, oh, six inches? <laughs> That's nothing. I know, exactly. When we have, when we, tonight, we have a snowstorm that is scheduled to be somewhere between uh Around 16 inches, I believe. And that's enough for us to go, oh, we're getting a little bit of snow. <laughs> well, okay. Everyone just grab some food. We're we're used to it up here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, if, if you know, we really were to drop this much snow somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line, it would be, oh, my God! Yeah. It's an apocalypse. Yeah. I, 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 I tell you, uh, we get an inch and a half, two inches here here in Louisville, Kentucky, and people friggin' panic over that. It's like, oh my god, it's the end of the world. And I feel fine. <laughs> 500 geek points if anybody gets that <laughs> reference. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yes. What else do we want to talk about? Um... I guess we'll get this out of the way here. We, we've made it no secret, even though we love Justice League and the DC Animated Universe, uh, we are also Transformers fans. And holy crap, multiple versions of Masterpiece Rodimus. Not just a Hasbro and a, and a Takara version, but a Hong Kong version as well. <laughs> now, which version are you going to get? Uh, poor Proto Man, he has to get six of everything. <laughs> That man is going to be broke. Yeah, Proto Man's going to be not. Proto Man's going to go bankrupt over over Masterpiece Rodimus. <laughs> it is a masterpiece, though. Yes, yes, it is. So back to the superhero stuff. We are going to take a quick break. You're going to hear, I don't know, some random favorite clips of ours, I guess, and we'll come back with the uh, season five overall discussion. So, yes, Season 5 of Justice League. Now, you said off-air, it just it didn't seem like it was a whole season. Yeah, it seemed really just short. It It's not so much that it was short. I mean, it was a full animated 13-episode season, as far as animated series goes. Animated series are either 13 episodes per season or 26 episodes per season, depending on the show and the producers and all that. Um, but... The reason why it probably seemed like it went by so fast or seemed like it was really short is because great storytelling, a lot of action. I mean, a few of those uh, episodes 22 through 24, I mean, we, I, I remember there was a couple of them where we barely had any notes because it was just so much good action. That's true. Um, yes. Uh, let's start with the bad stuff first. Uh, the worst episodes of this season, at least for me, are Chaos at the Earth Core, To Another Shore, and Patriot Act. I could not stand those ones. Um, Patriot Act, as I said when we reviewed that, it was nice to see, even though we didn't really have to see what happened to Eileen, but it was kind of nice to see like the remnants of what happened to Cadmus after Divided We Fall. But, I mean, really, Eiling turning into giant hulking-looking thing and coming after all of these heroes who have no superpowers? Oh, God. And th there wasn't any wrap-up to it either. Just, oh, he runs off into the sunset. Yeah. That's it? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he Hulk jumped into the sunset, Yeah. You can't tell me it wasn't the Hulk. Dear God. <laughs> uh, so funny, so funny. So what about you? What are some of your least favorite or hated episodes? Grudge Match. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. That's It's right up there. I, I hate roulettes. And the, just... Every, every sci-fi story has got to have that brawl episode you know they always go into the black black market brawl fight it's just every season every or every series sanctuary did it i'm pretty sure star trek did it at one point i know someone will probably be like no but to illustrate my point it's just one of those cliched episodes that is always in a storyline and i just i think we could have done without honestly <laughs> It was we did it once. We don't have to come back and do it a second time. 
Well, um, the difference, at least for me, is before you move on, the difference for me was Grudge Match was all girl fights. Whereas, uh, um, oh, what the hell's the damn episode? Um, the one with Wildcat. Shit. Cat and Canary. Uh, yeah. That was more of Wildcat going up against all. It, it was more of the regular, you know, male ultimate fighter things. Whereas Grudge Match was all chick fights. And as I said in that episode when we reviewed it, only if they were naked and there was a tub of pudding. <laughs> Yeah, it still wouldn't do anything for me. <laughs> well, yeah, that's because you prefer yeah. the other. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> swing the other way. <laughs> uh, great brain robbery. Just, again, another cliche episode. And if you've seen one, you've seen a lot of them. And the only one, only time I've ever seen this cliche pulled off well was Farscape. See, I disagree with you because great brain robbery was. Uh, an amazing use of Michael Rosenbaum's and Clancy Brown's voice talents. Okay. But other than that, I mean, story-wise, did it really progress anything? Well, we did, you know, we did get some closure as to why, you know, when we got, um, when, uh, who was it that said, I think it was Red Tornado that said, he, he speed shifted right through the wall and, and, uh, and Green Lantern was like, that's why the real Flash doesn't do it. Because yeah. his power is so... So, I mean, it's not like they're ignoring what happened in Divided We Fall, but at the same time, I mean, you know... See, I never got it as, that, as a reaction to Divided We Fall. It was one of those, he has the power, he chooses not to use it. Yes. Um, I know I'm mixing genres here, but with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> or not in the Marvelverse, thank God. <laughs> Well, what else? with uh, great comic writing comes great retconning. <laughs> or horrible retconning, I should say. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, Chaos at the Earth's Core. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love Stargirl, but uh, that's that's pretty much it for this season. Yes. Um, for me, my favorite episodes are almost everything else. <laughs> I didn't really... Dead Reckoning was okay, it wasn't a great, great episode, but, um, I mean, if there was ones that I had to throw in kind of like on the fence type of stuff, like I don't love it, but I don't hate it, it would probably be uh, uh, Dead Reckoning. Flash and, Flash and Substance was great for all the Flash references, but probably Dead Reckoning and Far From Home, I'm on the fence about as far as I could go either way as far as liking them or not liking them, but... I Am Legion, Shadow of the Hawk, uh, Great Brain Robbery, uh, Ancient History, Alive and Destroyer, all amazing to me, I think. Um, just actually seeing and do have it, they did Legion of Doom, and they did an updated version of the headquarters, and it was just amazing. And then... Uh, and, and, and the two Hawk Girl centric stories with uh, Shadow of the Hawk and Ancient History. Uh, I'm a huge James Remar fan, and I actually love him voicing Hawkman. That's that's just a great voice cast, I think, for that role. Um, and just seeing that story was amazing. Plus, you know, Shire in that dress. Oh my God, Judas Priest. <laughs> it's a good band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Alive being, you know, we you know we had back in Task Force X in, in Season 4 where it was all of the supervillains or all of the non-powered supervillains or whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, infiltrating the Watchtower, where in Alive is, is all the super-powered villains just, it's an entire villain episode up to the very end where you get like maybe three seconds of heroes at the end where Lex says, we have a problem. Um... And the twist, because nobody knew, uh, I don't think at the time, and, and a lot of people probably might not realize this, but the twist at the end of Alive, as far as uh, who Tala actually brings back, oh my, I was shocked, because they specifically said back in, uh, what was it, uh, season three? Uh, where, where is it? Um, no, let's see. Season, that's season one. Yeah, yeah, no, they, they specifically said back in season two of Justice League 
when they were still doing two parters, uh, the, the Twilight two parter. Um, and no, this has nothing to do with new moons and werewolves and all that bullshit. Uh, but the Twilight two parter with Darkseid and Brainiac, they specifically said in the commentaries that Darks, you know, they they killed Darkseid. He's he's gone. He's not coming back. So when he was the one that came back in alive, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Um, and then Destroyer. Destroyer to me is, is just amazing. As I've said in a previous episode when we talked about Epilogue, I know I understand what they were doing with Epilogue because they didn't realize they were going to get picked up for a th- uh, third, uh, third or fourth season. Um, they didn't pick, they didn't realize they were going to get picked up for another season, so I understand what they did with Epilogue. But for me, Epilogue needs to go after Destroyer. Mm. What about you? Which ones do you like the best? God, um... So we got Ancient History and... Uh, Shadow of the Hawk, which was a great two-parter, which really should have been, like, closer together in the, se- in the season, I think. Yeah, they should have been. It was made into a two-part, like connection um i liked dead reckoning like it was okay um but i really think that dead man from a character point of view um i like what they're doing with uh brightest day and making him deal with the morality of who he is and what it means to live which is the whole yeah dichotomy which i think would have been a lot better um that being said um i i I think Sh- uh, Shadow of the Hawk and uh, Ancient History. Thank you, Ancient History. I'm looking at it, going, what, "What did this say?" <laughs> um, I really think that that is definitely one of the star story arcs. Yeah, the only problem with having them closer together within the episodes of the season is that time actually elapses. Oh yeah, I, I, I know that. But... From Shadow of the Hawk through those other episodes, and then we come to Ancient History. So, um, I think but... Destroyer was a nice way to wrap it up. Oh yeah. Um, Good. I, I still kind of feel like the end of it could have been a little bit better. Um, not quite so forced. I didn't think it was forced at all. The the end of Destroyer was just awesome. If they had, in the seasons, like, put a little bit of, uh, a bit here and a bit there about Jean in, the like, the little Chinese guy's form, like, just a little bit more than just, oh, random guy on the, on the Great Wall of China. Oh, I need to go help. Wait, who the hell is this guy? If there had been a little bit more pretense and preamble... But see, I think the whole point of when they were, oh, what was it? Was it was it far from home? Not far from home. Um, to another shore. When they had that episode, they had John leave. John leave. The point of it was he had to go out and be away from the league and live his life as a pseudo human or whatever you want to call him, um, or whatever. And he had to be gone. It's kind of like Dark Side. He had to be gone. I don't think it would have worked as well, and, and because the whole point is, you're, you're supposed to have that shock and awe of, okay, you know, you're supposed to have that, like, what the fuck moment of, okay, who's this little Chinese old man saying he has to go help? But you're supposed to have that shock and awe when, I mean, I knew immediately it was Jean as soon as I saw him turn into the Red Dragon, for Christ's sake. Obviously. But, um... I think you have to have that shock and the awe for when Diana jumps in the air and, and hugs him. Uh, I don't think it would have worked if you had him, like, even as a background character in some of the other episodes between uh, uh, To Another Shore and, and Destroyer. It just seemed like he was this random Dusex machina. Nah, not really. Because you're reuniting the, the original seven... And they're they're living their lives. They're they're going on. I mean, and of course, you know the whole thing where, where Flash goes, and these are the end times. And then Diana goes, the adventure continues. Uh, 
the point of it is that they, they've left themselves open ended with Destroyer. Yes, chronologically in the DC animated universe, Epilogue kind of ends it all, but even Epilogue leaves it open to where Batman, uh, t- uh, Terry McGinnis's Batman, flies up into the sky. So, I mean, we know the league goes on in the future, but um, what I want to, what I'd like to see nowadays is the same animation style as Justice League and have adventures after Destroyer up until Batman Beyond, up until the first episode of Batman Beyond where Bruce Wayne in the uh, premiere episode in Rebirth of Batman Beyond has his final adventure. I want to see those stories now. I'd like to see what happens after Destroyer up until we get to Batman Beyond chronologically in the DCAU. Um, That's one of the reasons why I love Destroyer is because it does leave it open-ended. I honestly would love to get just one, like, more seasons, more info. Yeah. Like, not a full, like, oh, just Batman, but, like, maybe some one-shots here or there. Which, I mean, it kind of makes me excited for Young Justice, honestly. Because we're getting that... We're getting the characters that we know and love and... Kind of. I mean, Young Justice is completely different. Young Justice is the sidekicks. <laughs> Even uh, but there's a, a lot of, like, the actual Justice Oh, League yeah, and then, yeah, no, I, I understand that, but the main point of Young Justice is... Robin and 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 Aqualad and 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 the 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 sidekicks. Even though the even though the the promos say don't call them sidekicks, well, that's what they are. They're they're Justice League Miss Mar- mini Miss Martian. Yeah. What? Miss Martian. Oh God! Don't get me started. Hey, she's an actual valid character. The whole head slapping thing. But anyway, back to season five of Justice League. Um. Um, yeah, and the, the the voice cast for this season. I mentioned uh, uh, James Remo earlier, but just all of the like Daniel Day Kim as Metron. Oh yeah. Uh, anything that comes out of Kevin Conroy's mouth, anything that comes out of Batman's mouth is just gold. Um, the relationship between Jean, uh, not Jean, uh, John Stewart, uh, Mari, and and Shaira. Uh, in, in the episode, uh, oh, uh, in 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 uh, ancient history, I love that whole scene. It's like I could put some water, you'd never know it. Not worried one bit. bit. <laughs> and out it goes into the trash. Yeah. yeah. Um. But just the and and Gina Torres was was Mari. And that 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 was just amazing. Um, actually, it's funny. I'm, I'm getting uh, into um, every morning at six a.m. on TNT. They run syndicated episodes of uh, Joss Whedon's Angel series, and we're just now getting up to the point uh, in in the season season four where uh, Gina Torres is going to come in as as Jasmine. So just she's got a great overall voice. Um, and, you know, Destroyer, the speech that Superman makes at the end, same thing. George Newbern delivered that spot on awesome speech. That that was great. You know, the whole thing about that man won't take a, you know, that, that man won't stop until he can't take a breath speech. And then the whole, you know, just see how powerful I really am. Um just overall, season five was, it, as I said, it was great storytelling. It was awesome, awesome animation. Um, there are plot points, not really plot points, but there are some episodes, as we've said, that kind of suck. <laughs> um, Poor Tala. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 and Tala, Tala's voicing, oh my god, Juliet Landau. Voicing Tala and giving her that that Natasha Moose and Squirrel type of voice was just... Oh, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Lex, baby, you don't really think I cheat on you. <laughs> that was Moose and Squirrel. 
because we are Ustreaming this episode, I'm so going to throw one of the Ustream watchers under the bus. Glade Packer, you are wrong, dude. Legacy was awesome in Superman the Animated Series, the, 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 the two-part finale of Superman the Animated Series. It's awesome for what it was, but Destroyer is a very awesome episode for JLU. But uh, anyways, um, what else you want to bring up about season five here? Um, I th- okay, so we've already talked about in prior episodes the villain centric episodes. Mm-hmm. But I think one of the episodes that really needs to be brought up again is Flash and Substance. Oh yeah. For that, there's more ways to deal with villains than just you know beating them with punches and sticks and laser blasts, especially with how he dealt with the trickster, and it was. Nice to have Mark Hamill back, who is more than just some whiny little kid on a desert planet. <laughs> but, yeah, it was it's great to see that there's more than one way to, to deal with these people. Yeah. And that they're not just, not all villains are there just to take over the world. Some of them are just there to steal enough to make their mortgage payments. <laughs> True. And I think what really comes in is that whole reaction between Batman, Orion, Trickster, and Flash, where Batman and Orion are are used to having to make people talk and not used to sitting down. And actually, this is is a perfect uh, callback to epilogue, I mean, really, because with Batman, he's used to making people talk. And he's used to doing whatever it takes. That's that's his mantra throughout the entire DC animated universe, between Batman the Animated Series all the way up to Justice League and Batman Beyond. Do whatever it takes is is pretty much his, his mantra as far as that goes. But I just now noticed that his actions in uh, Flash and Substance of trying to make Trickster talk, and then Flash was like, no, just, you know, let me handle this. And he goes over and he talks to Trickster and he you know, talks him into turning himself in, um, where we have that later in epilogue in that, in that JLU flashback scene where Batman sits with Ace. Uh, I mean, you know, that's probably where he got the whole, the whole thing of, of sitting with Ace is from Flash. And let's be honest. I mean, Flash is, is easily the heart of the entire league. Uh, I mean, at least the conscience. Yeah. He's definitely the person to sit there and be like, to take a step back and be like, okay, everybody, you know, you're making a really bad decision here. Why do we have only these options? And even, you know, and and another thing about, you know, the characters, I mean, Green Arrow. What cartoon character is going to come straight out and say that he is left wing? (laughs) On a kid's show. (laughs) Exactly. You know? He specifically says, you know, I might be just an old lefty and blah, 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 but, you know, and, and Green Arrow, oh, God, don't get me started. Uh, uh, Green Arrow was just awesome. I would love to talk to Ken Schreiner or Shriver or whatever, whatever, whatever is his, how do you, how you say his name, just to get some Green Arrow uh, promos out of him. Uh, and I think... My favorite Green Arrow moment in the entire series was when he hummed his own theme music. <laughs> that was classic. I'm like, he did not just pull a crunk. He pulled yeah. a crunk. Yeah. Yeah, it was so, so awesome. Oh, God. So, so, so awesome. All right. Um, anything else we want to bring up before we move on? I think we've covered almost everything. All right. We're- oh, I do have to give... Um, I will say, though, Patriot Act, sticking their thumb out at Marvel. Uh, yeah. For Captain Nazi. That was so tongue-in-cheek. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That okay, that's was... all I got for now. <laughs> so we're going to move on to our final overall recap of Justice League. Each of us is willing to make the sacrifices a hero needs to make, even the ultimate one. I consider myself one of the luckiest guys in the business for having the opportunity to work with this entire career of of DC characters, all kind of culminating with Justice League. What's to stop history from repeating itself right here on Earth? 
we are. These were interesting characters in their own right, and they spark against each other in interesting ways. We love to see that when a group of disparate people somehow managed to work together for the duration. We didn't go in thinking we were going to make the best superhero show ever, but toward the end we realized, hmm, we may have made the best superhero show ever. I think if we look back at the Hanna-Barbera and the Filmation superhero shows, that we look at them today and we go, isn't that quaint, isn't that old fashioned? And yet, at the time, they were not that far from where the comic books were maybe 10 years before that. The Justice League was sort of the Kiwanis Club. And it was seven guys and Wonder Woman who was literally their secretary. And they all agreed on everything, and they were all hail fellows well met. And they got along perfectly, and they were really powerful, and the villains didn't have a chance. Teams in the early days had a cobblestone quality. It wasn't so much a matter of pitting the characters against each other in their personalities originally. You couldn't have conflict at television at that time. So they had to fight natural disasters. And everything had to be nice and friendly and kind. When you're a kid, you don't know anything about how, how, do, how do adults relate to each other. It's comforting, it's reassuring to see that everybody gets along. They wouldn't use the real villains from the comics. That bugged me as a kid. I'd, I'd rather read the comics than watch the cartoons. So when we started looking at doing Justice League, we wanted to try and be sort of more true to where the comic books had come since that time. We were all supercharged with enthusiasm for the show and, and the, the possibilities of what we could do in a superhero show. Comics are more respected. Standards and practices understand that you need drama, conflict. We wanted to stick with the main big seven of the Justice League. And it was important for us to find unique voices for all of the heroes. We really wanted to mix it up with some tension amongst the team. We had already established that Superman and Batman had tension, and then there were these new characters that had to come in. And so we defined them by types. Green Lantern was the no-nonsense military guy. Flash was kind of the slacker, laid-back dude. Wonder Woman was a princess, newly arrived, who didn't really know the norms of the world. Whereas Hawkgirl was knowledgeable about things that Wonder Woman had no idea about. John Jones was the ultimate outsider. It was about them learning how to deal with each other and, and learn how to work together as a team. I think it was cool that, no, they didn't pretend that they liked each other. They didn't pretend that they agreed with one another. You know something, Bruce? You're not always right. Character is conflict, and so if you've got a team where all of the characters agree with each other all the time, you're gonna have a pretty boring show. I think it's more interesting to see people who don't agree come together for a larger purpose than to see people who absolutely agree on everything. As much fun as the old stuff was, I think uh, we had a little bit more fun. The original concept for Unlimited was that it was going to be kind of like a cross between like an ongoing team show, like, you know, like the first two seasons of Justice League, but also kind of like a weird backdoor pilot anthology. You know, we were going to be bringing these other characters and the shows would be theoretically more about the, the guest stars. We ended up getting deeper into the characters in the uh, half hour pieces than we did in the original series. It's important to have the, all these different characters because it creates a reality that's separate from our own reality. We have to believe that there's a world where there are all these different kind of colorful costume characters who interact with each other. The B-level characters, I think, are kind of more interesting. We can sort of have a little bit of license with the characters to do what we, we want with them. When you start bringing characters like The Question or Vixen or Huntress, we had no idea how they interacted. Once we realized we had two full seasons of shows that we could do, and we had this huge cast, we could kind of create like this, this big mega plot. The world was not just contained to the superheroes. You could bring in characters like Amanda Waller, who is ostensibly a good character, but she does some really vile things to accomplish her needs. You really think we can do something with this? We did an entire story that was told from the point of view of the bad guys. We realized, hey, every time Cadmus does something against the Justice League, the Justice League wins. So that means Cadmus is just really not that credible a threat anymore. So we needed to have Cadmus come in and win in one episode. Listen to me, we've got one advantage. This tower's so big and there's so much staff on it, no one's going to notice us. 
unless one of you does something stupid. We treated our villains as if they were the good guys, and we treated the Justice League as if they were like these unknowable, you know, godlike beings up in this, this watchtower in space. You've got to have somebody monitoring them to see that they're not really bent on world domination or they've got some villainous plot of their own. And yet, by trying to monitor them, they become the bad guys. Somebody's got to do something about this. Do your stockholders know about this, Bruce? A line item hidden in the aerospace R&D budget. When we first started Justice League, our first self-imposed rule that we gave ourselves was that we didn't want to rely too much on the continuity of our previous series, you know, Batman and Superman. And as we did more shows, it became clear that it was a, a universe. By the time we got to Justice League Unlimited, we were just think thinking back and said, you know, we've had several secret organizations in both Superman and Batman. We realized, hey, you know, what if every one of those secret organizations that we'd had before, what if they're all part of the same secret organization? <laughs> How do we deal with the things that we messed up and manage to sweep them under the rug or justify them? The nice thing about the Justice League animated series, it has the benefit of that would-be cohesion and that understanding that you're trying to create a coherent world. We started deliberately trying to, to tie all this stuff in, together into like this one big massive, you know, climactic story that was, you know, gonna put a big exclamation point at the end of the, of the sentence of, uh, you know, the DC Universe. We knew with Justice League that we wanted to touch on several famous stories from the DC comic books, and one of them was for the man who had everything. The idea of Superman living in a fantasy world. I promise you, I'll never forget. We knew we wanted to adapt that for two reasons. We had introduced Mongol in Justice League and we knew he had a mad on for Superman. And we also wanted to do the Trinity idea of Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman teaming up. So this was a perfect story to adapt. So we really stuck close to it. But I think this is yours. <laughs> I think my favorite episode to write was the Christmas episode where Superman kind of takes pity on John Jones and takes him back to Smallville with him for the holidays. Kitty. It really was like doing another episode of the Superman series because we had the same voice cast doing Ma and Pa Kent, the same house, but it just felt like, you know, going home a little bit. You were able to keep a lot of the same creative threads running from show to show, particularly in regards to character continuity. You could take a character such as Orion that showed up in Superman and then really play him out and give him a greater role in Justice League. Talk while you still have a jaw. In the Batman story that features the demon, it's a story that really is focused on trying to convince the audience that magic can happen in Batman's world. By the time we get to Justice League, that work has already been done, and so then we can do a story that focuses on who the demon is and what his story is. Using all of those worlds to make our world seem bigger and more real. So when you saw an adventure, you realize these characters had lives outside of the few minutes that we saw in each episode. Then you got somebody like Supergirl who's just trying to prove herself, you know, and get out from under her cousin's shadow. The innocent from another world who doesn't know her way around to a contemporary teenager to a grown-up woman who's ready to leave and do her own life. That makes for a lot of really cool dynamics. You know, in some cases, I want to see those stories more than I want to see them going out and beating up Felix Faust or the Parasite again. When they leave the story for a while and come back, there was always growth. There was always something that had happened in their lives that affected where we are now. Working with the cast of Justice League was terrific because if you ever had a favorite character in the DC Universe, you got to use them. Whenever we, we adapt a character from the comics into the animation, you know, we try to stay true to the, at least to the intent of the character. You want to reproduce the essence of what people are interested in, what the fans are interested in about that character, and make it visible to someone who hasn't read all the comic books. A lot of the characters in the DC Comics came from the 40s and 50s, and so when we looked at uh, trying to introduce them to a new audience, we had to find ways to make them relevant. I've got 60 years of Green Arrow incarnations to look at and to pick and choose what I want that helps serve the story I'm telling now. This is somebody from a comic book you've been reading your entire life, 
and you can have them come in and do something that's very much like that character and then you move on and it makes it feel much richer. It was also a chance to take characters who had never appeared in animation before and really give them a larger presence, a bit more stature. The difficulty in adapting those never before adapted characters is usually tone. Say something. Preemptive strike. Our hawk and dove, is, is it comedic or, or what? And it requires a lot of creativity on the part of the writers to make them come to life. The main benefit to the characters that haven't appeared many times in movies and other TV shows is that people don't have as fixed an image. Everybody knows Wonder Woman, Superman, The Flash, Batman. Not so many people know Hawk and Dove, the Vigilante, Vixen. You have to look at the character and figure out, okay, what is specific to Mr. Terrific? What are the elements that are Mr. Terrific? How best can we present them? If they had their own show, what they would be doing on that show. A character like Green Arrow, he's straight up out of the comics. His look, he's got the Neil Adams costume. He's got, you know, the, the left-wing liberal, you know, sensibility. I know he actually talks about being a lefty. The government must do for people what people can't do for themselves. Who does that? What comic character, what cartoon character has ever admitted to have left-leaning philosophy? I just helped a little guy. At a big club like this, you tend to forget all about him. He's the, the swashbuckler, he's also the womanizer, you know, I mean, he's, he's straight up Ollie Queen out of the comics. Back off, nuke boy! Captain Adam, he gets his authority from the military. And if the military is against the Justice League, then he's against the Justice League. Some of the more obscure characters, they're dropped in to flavor certain episodes, and yet, in some cases, they really catch on with an audience. Like, I know the question really became a great character. I had no idea that the Girl Scouts were responsible for the crop circle phenomenon. Few people do. Few even think to ask the question. To get the appeal of the question, you have to almost write a parody of the question and then pull it back a couple steps. You're lucky to have me along. Hardly. You're drawn to my eccentric charm. Our version of the question is influenced by Ditko's original character. He's a wonderful contrast to the entire league because he has no face, he has no powers, but really what, what he has is a, is a mind and a point of view. And, and that's his power, and it's amazing. In the comics, a character like The Question would never, ever be in the Justice League. But that was just like this weird conceit we had. Literally any DC hero could be drafted into the Justice League, because you know it's like, hey, if we need you, we'll call you. Buona Beast, be ready. Buona Beast, oh, for crying out loud. I, I didn't even grow up with the character. I'd seen ads for it when I was a kid, but I was always intrigued by this thing. He's nothing like the character in the comics because the character in the comics is probably the weirdest character the DC ever, ever came up with. He was fun for, for an episode. He just added a little bit to it. I don't know if we're gonna see the Buona Beast series. A lot of the guys we chose were frankly just red shirts. They're just guys to walk through in the background sometimes when we need a a crowd scene of superhero characters. Some of them never even opened their mouths. Aztec, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan. I'm I don't know Aztec. But in a way, we didn't abuse the character by doing him incorrectly either. The wall's submolecular integrity has been compromised. We tried to pick characters who were visually interesting. We wanted to break up the silhouettes of them so they weren't all just guys in spandex. Vigilante's a really good case in point. He's a character that, even if you know nothing about the comics or you've never read a character that had the Vigilante in before, the minute you see him, you get him. He's a cowboy guy who rides a motorcycle. Done. Same thing with the Shining Knight. Okay, he's a, he's a knight. He's a guy in golden armor with a sword. It's like, okay, you get it, you know? Logically, characters like Green Lantern or Superman probably should not be interacting with characters like Green Arrow because characters like Green Arrow are very likely to be inadvertently killed. But they work so well in the team structure. You introduce an element of humanity to the concept of superheroes, and it provides a touchstone for the audience. They provide characters that can serve as the unpretentious contrast, sometimes the conscience of other characters. Uh, sometimes it's uh, comic relief. Sometimes it's that gruff, scrappy kind of quality that we long to see and that by nature Superman or Wonder Woman do not exhibit. But certainly Superman wanted them there, and Batman wanted to be there to keep these godlike characters from losing touch with the people that they had sworn to protect.
the challenge of Justice League is how to justify getting a group of people together with their own ideologies, their own philosophies, and they don't really f fight well, play well with others. So you create a threat, a world threat, a cataclysm that's so great that there's no excuse. These people have to get together to fight. In the end, we did make a really great superhero show that is bigger than the sum of its parts. We love comics, we love the characters, and we feel an incredible responsibility to present them in the best way that we know how. Millions more people will see these characters because of the animation than would ever have known about them just from comic books. It's about more than just superheroes. It's not just a cartoon, it's, it's an animated story, but it's, it's universal in its appeal. Hopefully, we were able to turn a whole new generation onto these classic characters. And you just heard Unlimited Reserve, which is the special feature on the bonus disc of the complete series of Justice League. And now it is time for us to do our overall series recap. Um, hmm. When did did you first watch this when it was on when it was running on Cartoon Network, or did you catch it? When it first aired on Cartoon Network. Did you really see? I caught it yep. way. I caught it way after that. I didn't catch it back in 2001 when it first started airing. I caught it, like, I think when I started to notice it, and I was like, what the hell is this show? Um, was I caught uh, Once in Future Thing Part 1 uh, when JLU was running. And I was like, whoa, more DC Animated Universe cartoons. Holy crap. Um and I've been hooked ever since. I, I, I truly believe myself to be a DC Anime Universe aficionado because I've read almost everything. I've listened to all the commentaries. I've watched every single episode multiple times. Um, and I just, I absolutely love it. Um, I'm going to put it out there right now. The two worst episodes of the entire series are... War World and Chaos at the Earth's Core. <laughs> I I want to disagree with you. Really? <laughs> the I will go with the uh, the episode that shall not be named. What War World? <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I just feel like there's another one that should have been should have been there. Well. Now, I'm looking at this as worst episode of the entire series, not just either the first two seasons of Justice League or the final three seasons of Unlimited. I'm looking at it as, like, episodes I will never, ever watch again. And as far as, like, the two worst ones, it would be War World and Chaos Theorist Core. Um, only a Dream... Eclipse and Terror Beyond are like in there somewhere, but they're not as bad as what about Maid of Honor. I liked Maid of Honor for what it was. It wasn't horrible. Uh, Hearts and Minds. The the good thing about Hearts and Minds was the voicing of of uh, Despero was was Keith David. Uh, but these episodes, while they are kind of bad. They're not worst episode ever. You know what I mean? I know Eclipse is pretty bad up there. It, it, it's bad, but it's not like 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 War World was just useless. War World shouldn't even have been in there. The only reason why they probably put War World in there was so they could have the, for the man who has everything later on in Unlimited, so Mongol could come back with the Black Mercy for Christ's sake. We won't talk about the Black Mercy. 
Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to go by season. Uh, for me, uh, my favorite uh, episodes from season one... Uh, I liked Secret Origins for the simple fact that it introduces us to the League. Uh, I still don't know how the hell Batman knew Hot Girl, but... It's the goddamn Batman. Yeah, it's everything. the goddamn Batman. Um, I like In Blackest Night as well, because we're getting, you know, GL stories and and everything else, um, which is very cool. Um, I liked... Injustice for All was okay, but it's not one that I really, really particularly care for. Um, I really like Night of Shadows. Edrigan Rules. Uh, gone, gone, the form of man. Rise the demon Edrigan. I'm going to have to get that clip again. Oh, God, I love that. Um, and then Savage Time, the three-parter that ended season one. I absolutely love that as well. What about you? Oh, let's go through. Let's see. Um, we had Secret Origins. Um, Blackest Night was okay. You just don't like it because it's not a Guy Gardner story. Ha! And still he comes up in the final episode. Whoa. Well, he's going to come up a little bit later when we talk about the toy line, so... Um, Let's see, uh, Enemy Below was... I, I liked it for Aquaman being total badass. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh... Injustice for All was kind of kind of funny. I, I mean, that was... Seeing him Mac on a cat. Just bats and cats. Um, oh uh, yeah. Uh, What'd you say? War World. Ugh. Yeah, that's all we can really say about that one. Paradise Lost was okay. Um, Brave and the Bold. It, it's nice to see Flash centric episodes, of course. Uh, and then we get to set up for the whole Gorilla City. Yeah. Um, Fury. And that was the one with the, the f- female-centric, like, oh, we're going to make every man in the world die. Yeah. Uh, um, Night of Shadows. Morgan Le Fay is pretty badass. I like her for a villain. Uh, and yes, Etrigan, Etrigan, Etrigan. Yep. You know what? Metamorphosis. I was not too thrilled with that episode. Really, Metamorpho, just nothing. Really. Could, they could have done something else with that episode. Um, Savage Time was pretty cool because we got to see Vandal Savage. It's yeah. a shame we didn't get to see Scandal Savage, which would be, would have been awesome. <laughs> but um, that's it for season one. Yeah, I, I and the thing about most of season one, well, they did rectify the fact that they made Superman an out and out wimp in this season. Um, the thing about season one is like uh, uh, Batman. Batman has great lines. Everywhere, not not just in JLU, but just in this entire series. Um, I don't need to do anything. I'm a part timer. Remember, yeah. yeah. Um, as far as season two, I liked uh, Twilight. Uh, I'm not gonna stop until you're just a greasy smear on my fist. Uh, I, I love that. Um, I like Tabula Rasa because I like seeing... First of all, we got to see Mercy in power. Lex was on the run. That was kind of cool. Uh, A Better World, Part 1 and Part 2, I like that. Um, I loved Hereafter. Hereafter was awesome. Uh, Hereafter was awesome for the simple fact that you have Bruce lamenting. Clark for like a minute and a half and then an explosion happens and then you like uh, and then he's like what was it you always said Clark the never ending fight or the never ending battle or whatever it was that that just you know so many different sides to Bruce Wayne slash Batman throughout this entire series and just that moment just made that hereafter so awesome for me 
Um, I could have done without the cockroach, the giant friggin' cockroaches. For Christ's sake, it looked like they were, you know, super troopers on on that planet fighting the damn cockroaches. Um, wild cards. Finally, a Joker episode in JLU or in 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 Justice League. Uh, anytime Mark Hamill has done the, the the voice of the Joker has been awesome. That was his last episode, right? No, that wasn't his last episode. That, that was the Joker's last episode in chronological order of DCAU, but that was not the last time that Mark Hamill appeared as as a voice in DCAU. Yeah, I meant the Joker. Yeah, it was the last time the Joker appeared. Um, let's see here. Uh, comfort and joy. I know we needed something between wild cards and star-crossed, but I don't know. I just... I like that we see the humanite again, the, the ultra humanite, and I like that it's kind of a. I mean, obviously it, it focuses on each of the league members, but um, um, it's not something I could watch all the time. I got to go back really quick. Uh, I didn't really bring up, even though only a dream on, on a whole. I don't really care for the episode, but again, it goes back to Batman and. <laughs> Give me a triple. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then him humming. Uh, you know, a, again, Batman moments in, in the DC anime universe are just awesome. No matter what he does, they're just awesome. Um, and then Starcrossed. Just for what. Starcrossed did several things. Starcrossed uh, showed us finally, after teasing us for so long about Shiera. Or a hot girl at this at this point, um, you know, you know, teasing us with with her origin and all that stuff. It finally showed the Thanagarians. Uh, it is the first time that they were ever out of their costumes, as far as in civilian clothes too. Yep, as far as the other ones, and we've learned which Flash is in Justice League. Uh, well, wait, hold on, hold on. Um, uh, Clark Kent. Wally West, Bruce Wayne. <laughs> I just it, 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 honestly, it, it it still it comes back to Batman. He just he delivers some of the best lines. Um, I don't know, Wally's got some good lines too. No, he does, but just the but way he's that one of those that needs to be playing off everybody else. Yeah, yeah. What about you for season two here? Season two. Um, uh, Twelve of the Gods was okay, kind of. Um, Tabula Rasa that was definitely up there. Uh, what? Only a Dream, that was awesome. Uh, again, Maid of Honor, eh? Really? Okay, I mean, yeah, it's Vandal Savage, but still, eh. The Princess of Casnia made me want to punch her. Um, Hearts and Minds is actually really good. Um, okay, A Better World. That that has to be one of the best episode story arcs for that season. Yeah. Setting everything up. Um, yeah. Terra Beyond, I really did like that one. Um, especially for giving all those nods to H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Yeah. Um... I hated Eclipsed. Secret <laughs> Society. Okay, yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, just because it leads up to later on down the road. Yeah. Um, hereafter, that was it was a singular episode to be nice, um, or a singular story arc. It, it's interesting to see. Oh, yeah, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a moral issue with with Clark. See him kind of harken back to Bruce, maybe. Just to be like, okay, hey, what have I got to do to survive? You mean um, hereafter? Yeah. Because oh, yeah. he had to go into the future. He, yeah, there's nothing. He's the, He thinks he's the only person alive on the planet. And he's powerless. 
Well, at the same time, it's nice to see the character development for Vandal Savage and why he would help them help yeah. them go back. Plus, I mean, Vandal is a good guy. <laughs> oh, coffee, tea, anyone? Yeah. Um, wild cards. That was such an awesome, awesome episode. Yeah, it was. Um, I can't croon about that one enough. Um, again, that embargo, damn it all to hell. But um. No, at least Joker was in this one. He was. And I have to wonder how good the episodes would be in the later seasons if they could have used the Bat villains. Yeah, but I mean, even so, with what we got for the later seasons, it was still awesome. Oh, it was still awesome, but I would have liked to have seen how the storylines could have been changed, especially if the Joker was still around in the whole Lex versus Grodd scenario. Yeah. Um, and then Starcrossed. That was an awesome, awesome, awesome way to end the season. Yes, it was. Now, before we go on to season three, we're going to talk about how did you like the the the, the season one, season two theme, the, the intro theme? Okay, it was it was good. I just think it could have been. It didn't have the oomph as the later season. I mean, I liked it for what it is and for what what the story format was for the first two seasons. But going into the unlimited seasons, I absolutely love the unlimited theme. The unlimited theme, I find my, every time I hear that, I hum along with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You know, we see in initiation that time has passed and they've expanded the league. Uh, we don't get like closure as to what happened at the end of Starcross that comes in bits and pieces throughout seasons three and four. But just seeing that scene where Green Arrow, ooh, Green Arrow, where Green Arrow, um, you know, gets beamed up to the watchtower, and they 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 pan around. You see all these heroes. It was just amazing to see that. It was eye opening. Just how many characters that they had there. Yep. This wasn't just one little like, oh, we're gonna have a few people show up. It'll be great. No, this is like a huge army that they've drummed up. Yes, exactly. And world spanning. Yep. Uh, for the man who has everything, uh, I love how they made the, uh, well, you, you can talk about this here in a minute, but I love how they did the Trinity episode with just centering the story around the big three of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Um, this came out of the comics, did it not? Isn't this a direct adaptation? You know, honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I think it is. I believe it was a, a, a comic. Popular story written by Alan Moore, illustrated by Dave Gibbons for Superman Annual 11 in 1985. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love, and, and this is something else we're going to bring up uh, throughout. I mean, they kind of played it up in Season 2, but not really. I mean, they kind of did with Starcross and stuff like that, but but not really. Um but Batman and Wonder Woman, will they, won't they? <laughs> I, I love the beginning scene of For the Man Who Has Everything because of the simple fact that it's Wonder Woman and Batman in the invisible jet, and they're just going, they're not going, they're not like bantering, but they're like trading, you know, comments to each other. And it she's, was just, ji- she's chiding him for, you know, did you buy, buy him a gift card? No, I bought cash. Cash. <laughs> And then she's like, she's like, he's like, well, what did you get him? I'm not going to tell. He's, he's got super hearing. He can hear that, too. <laughs> and uh, my only problem with this episode is Mongo. the fact that it's fucking Mongol. If, if it had been somebody else, it might be cooler, but... Yeah. But honestly though, it up till that point we didn't see Clark as this little wimp. 
you know, in this, he totally went absolutely ape. Oh, yeah. Like, this is the point where he's going to kill somebody. Okay, grab some popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and I love the way the way Bruce interacts as, as Clark is in the dream sequence and Wonder Woman's off fighting Mongol and he's like, good, she's in the Hall of Weapons, it'll buy her some time, but you got to snap out of it, Kent. Uh, and, and all this. And just seeing Loana and Van Al, uh, and um, what's his name? Um, fucking hell. Uh, uh, Shooter McGavin, Christopher McDonald as, uh, as Zorel. Mm. Or not Zorel. No, it's it's Jor Jorel. Sorry, holy crap! Superman fans will kill me now. Uh, yeah, they're at the door with the pitchforks. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. <laughs> but just having Christopher McDonald voice another character like that was just amazing, um, and having him reprise that role was awesome. Uh, we can skip Hawk and Dove. I hate that fucking episode. Well, you know what? Diana hates you, too. Who gives a shit if it's fucking Fred Savage? That episode sucked. Tell us how you really feel. I just did. Um, Fearful Symmetry, we get the start of more Cadmus stuff with the whole Supergirl uh, Galatea thing. Um... Eh, that one was all right. It was it wasn't bad. I didn't dislike it. It's something that I could probably watch again just for the fact that Green Arrow has a lot of good lines in it. How could you it's the start of the whole Cadmus thing though. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, t- technically the the actual full on arc goes it starts with Question of Authority, but there's hints throughout s- certain episodes between now and then. Um but, I don't know, Fearful Symmetry, it, it, it's not a bad episode. It's not an episode that I can't or don't want to watch, but it's just, it, it's one of those episodes where I could take it or leave it. What about you? Yes, you've seen it, you've watched it. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, kids stuff. Kids stuff is amazing. Says the man who collects Transformers. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. It was an excellent episode. Um, and the twist at the end. Like, after all that, what happens to the little brat? <laughs> he turns uh, into an old fart. And then we've eliminated an excellent villain from the series. More, uh, yeah, Morgane. Morgana? Yeah. Yeah. Not Morgane. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Ugh. Mordred. What a little annoyance. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Honestly, I think that little bastard deserved it. <laughs> but that's because I really didn't like him. You know, there's a lot of Arthurian people going, ah, oh, ah, oh, no. <laughs> Bad lupus. But. Uh, that's, that's funny. Plus, we get to see the crab mask. And for those that don't know what I'm talking about, it's the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Kyle's crab mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got it, I got it. And is there any other episodes you want to talk um, about? Yeah, there was... Let's... How could you miss this little piggy? No, hold on. I didn't miss it. I wasn't done with kids' stuff yet, but... Uh, no, the, the, uh, the crab mask... Um... Baby Etrigan? Oh, baby Etrigan, oh my god, that's just so awesome. You're not our mommy, no, but I promise you, we'll find we'll, we'll find all your moms, and I'm going to tell. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, baby Etrigan. Uh, baby Etrigan uh, makes boom boom. <laughs> this, is a, this is a job for Superman. <laughs> and I like uh, Diana and Batman again. You okay, tough guy? Lego, I'm fine. Right. <laughs> uh, 
and moving on to this little piggy. Um, why don't you give your thoughts for a second? I've got to go mute because I have to pull something up on the computer. So why don't you start giving your thoughts about this little piggy? Okay, it's we get to see the dichotomy, or not dichotomy, the relationship between uh, Bruce and Diana. You know, he's trying to put up all these like reasons why he couldn't possibly date. You know, we know he doesn't at the end anyway, but. Um, you know, why he thinks that it's inappropriate and, you know, why he's thinking about her and and she just promptly crushes the stone gargoyle in response. Uh, we get to see the sensitive side of Batman as he sits there and sings, which, you know, is by all accounts, well, worth the price of admission. Um, and we get to see Cersei, who is supposed to be the antithesis for for Diana. It was just an awesome, awesome episode throwbacks to Zatanna in the former episodes of the Batman animated series. I thought it was just great. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then Wonder, Wonder Pig using, uh, using the bracelets. The bracelets. That's so awesome. Uh, the reason why I went mute there for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, um, was because I was looking up the Justice League Unlimited toy line because I saw something in there the other day did you see Wonder Pig? Hold on, hold on. I, I knew that there was a Batman with Wonder Pig, but there's... I, I don't know if it's already released. That's why I'm looking for it. There's supposed to be Bawana Beast with Wonder Pig. <laughs> and I can't find the damn listing anymore. Uh, Warlord, Superman... Here, here we go. Bawana Beast with Wonder Pig. Late spring 2011 singles. Oh, God. That's you know you got to get it. See, the funny thing is, I, I would have... I, I, I don't have the Batman with Wonder Pig, but I guess because I would have the... I have another JLU Batman already. I guess Bawana Beast with Wonder Pig would be cool because I could have them both standing there. I'd have the Batman and the and the Bawana Beast with Wonder Pig standing there, but that's just so awesome. The wannabe a beast? Yeah, Bawana Beast. Um, so, so awesome. No, James, not Spider Pig. No, Wonder Pig. There's a difference. Oh, I just got this horrible mental image of Spider Pig hanging upside down, trying to kiss Wonder Pig. <laughs> Wonder Pig. Oh, God. And the Spider Man kiss. Go there. Why did you have to go there? God damn it. Why wouldn't I go there? Yeah, that's that's true. We, we've gone other strange places. Hot wing sure. sucks. Yeah. Wait, what? Hot wing sucks. Like that's. Not oh bizarre. well, yeah. That that was me. That wasn't you. I I came up with hot wing sex. And for those of you uh, who haven't listened to the Secret Origins podcast before, what hot wing sex is is anytime hot girl gets with anybody, more specifically John Stewart, but anybody, it's hot wing sex. Um, uh, all right. So the return, uh, the return featured the return of Amazo. Uh, one of my favorite bits in this is the Mork and Mindy gag with the egg shaped barbershop chair thing throughout the tunnel going into it. And then the get smart gag with the opening doors and closing doors. Um, and the return also featured at the very end is the return of Shaira Hall, AKA hot girl, that was cool. Um, I see what they did there. Ah, double entendre of the yep. words. Yep. Uh, I did not destroy Ole. It was in my way. I simply moved it. Moved it. Well, could you move it back? It is done. <laughs> you gotta love Robert Picardo. I absolutely loved seeing Kyle Rayner again. Because I think the last time we had seen Kyle was in Superman the Animated Series. He was in oh. Superman the Animated Series? Yep. In Brightest Day. That's I tried to point that out to you in, in, in the uh, when we reviewed Blackest Night, way back in episode one, uh, episode two. You know what? It's Kyle. Kyle sucks. You know what? He dies every couple of episodes. You know what? Guy Gardner one. sucks. So yep, yep, yep. Guy Gardner sucks. And even though Guy Gardner is getting an action figure in the Justice League Unlimited line, it specifically says... Non-show character. 
I got punchy, boy. But no, but what I was trying to say was way back when we did in the In Blackest Night episode, I didn't realize at the time that in the Superman the Animated Series there was an episode called In Brightest Day. So you have the first two lines of the Green Lantern Oath in the DC Animated Universe as episode titles, In Brightest Day and Blackest Night. Or evil shall escape my sight. What? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, evil shall escape my sight, yeah. Um, the greatest story never told. Well, thank God it was never fucking told. I hate that fucking episode. Booster I Gold. like it. Booster Golden kiss my ass. You know, he might. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. The only good thing about that episode was Skeets. That was funny. But, I love Skeets. Yeah, I, I love Skeets. Skeets was awesome. But Booster Gold? Fuck Booster Gold. But they had elongated man. Who was the Piv? Yeah, the Piv. Yep. Um, yeah, Jeremy Piven. Uh, and then Ultimatum was their version of the uh, Wonder Twin Super Friend Thingamabob thing. Because uh, Ultimatum has the um, the Ultiman. And uh, two of the uh, Shifter and... Or, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Shifter and Downpour, Downpour and Shifter were basically the Wonder Twins, for Christ's sake. All they needed was Gleek. Yep. I like Gleek for some reason. And when I say Gleek, I mean the monkey from Super Friends. I don't mean those fucking Glee fan people. Hey! Fuck that show. Impression on the Glee. No. Fuck that show. (laughs) Uh... And then we have Dark... Well, 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 before I go on to Dark Heart, what did you think of Ultimatum? Uh... I thought it was okay. I, I like the fact that they made the the Winter Twins actually cool. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. No, no, they were cool. They, when no, they were mindless, they, when they were mindless. Oh yes. Well, when they were mindless later on, yes. But in this episode, so a in comparison to what they used to be, they're still cool. <laughs> well, in in this specific episode, though, they're so super emo. Well, yeah. How else are they going to get the sales up for those girls? It was before <laughs> Twilight. <laughs> God. That's so wrong. Shut up, Glade. I don't care what you say. Um, uh, moving on to the dark heart. Uh, Batman to all points. I could use some air support since I can't fly at all. Now would be good. You're good. <laughs> And uh, James Hennigan or Jamie in the, in the in the chat said a second ago in, in the uh, in the Ustream chat Wonder Boobies. Well, this is where Wonder Boobies really comes in because she put the atom in between right her tits. <laughs> Wonder Woman has atom in her cleavage. You jealous? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hell. Um, and Darkheart really was more Cadmus stuff because Cadmus took the remnants of the Dark Heart, even though they could never get any of it to work again. But that'll come up way later. Never mind the giant space gun that they used. Oh yeah, the space gun to to uh, to to dig the trench. Yeah, that's right. Yep, and that put everybody on edge. Yep. Um, I always used to get Wake the Dead and Dead Reckoning confused. I always thought Dead Reckoning with uh, uh, Boston Brand was Wake the Dead, but Wake the Dead is the is the uh, zombie Grundy episode. He already was a zombie. Well, no, 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 no. I, I mean, like in the in, in the Terror Beyond when he died, way back then, when you know that that ended w- with showing the grave, Solomon Grundy, born on a Monday. Yes, he already was dead, but Grundy himself was finally dead. And then in this one, in the beginning of this one, stupid ass fucking high schoolers 
try to arise something and what they, they got something out of it. What they what they got out of it was a more zombified Grundy because Grundy has no emotions. He's just pure energy and all that stuff. Rage. Yes, rage. Internet rage. Anyway, um, <laughs> the once in future thing two parter. The only two parter in JLU. Well. Uh, to, at least the only two part that actually says part one and part two because Shadow of the Hawk and Ancient History while they are parts one and part two they don't specifically say that in the title uh, part one was Weird Western Tales and part two was Time Warped I love this was one hell of a way to go out on a season this was awesome you're just saying that because you got to see Wonder Woman in boots and tight fitting clothes what? And she was all dressed up like a Oh, yeah, as a, cow, as a cowgirl? Yeah, I don't really care. I'd rather see her in a short skirt. So, anyway. Or a slinky dress. Oh, wait, who's a, who's a lucky bastard? Uh, anyway, um, yeah, Once in Future Thing Part 2 I absolutely loved. Because we get to see an adult static. Um, we get to see old Bruce again. Very, very cool. We actually, the greatest thing about Once in Future Thing Part 2, we get to see young Bruce and old Bruce tag team somebody as far as questioning somebody. Crutchy. And, shut up. Crutchy old Bruce. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, w- one of the greatest things about that was uh, Batman being the good guy and Green Lantern goes it's all relative <laughs> and I like uh, uh, Terry McGinnis's Batman Beyond line of Bruce Wayne Batman Batman Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne. or have you met <laughs> not now great what did they used to call it stereo <laughs> <laughs> oh god um, and then going into, or did you have any thoughts on Once and Future thing, just as kind of like wrap up and overall? Um, no, honestly, I think you've covered all of it. It was a great two part episode, and it was. the whole <laughs> man Shader was a was a grumpy pregnant lady, the cranky pregnant lady. Of course, if I laid an egg that size, he he he's kidding, Dad. He's kidding. <laughs> So we know what's going to happen. It's just a question of getting to that point. Well, the other thing is, I, I, I know you said you didn't quite care for Metamorphosis with Metamorpho. Yeah. But I, and I didn't. I knew this before. I'm going to bring this up, but I believe in that something about GL said whenever he has his firstborn, he would name him after Rex. And lo and behold, his name is Rex. Warhawk is Rex Stewart. Um, and we should mention that Warhawk was a character that they made up for this continuity. He was never in comics before. So, um, moving into season four, uh, Cat and Canary. Cat and Canary is okay. It has that first, um, tensions between Huntress and Canary. Canary, and it has uh, Green Arrow, fine, you know, first noticing Canary, which was just awesome. But you probably like the scene more where he actually comes out of the shower or the steam room or whatever. That was a very nice scene. <laughs> yes. Um, ties that bind, meh, whatever. I I get that it's Kirby characters, I get that it's fourth world and all that, but... I just yeah. I I have no connections to that episode. I have no connections to those characters other than Granny Goodness, because she was in Superman the Animated Series and it's Apocalypse and all that. But I just you know they, they named the villain Vermin Vunderbar. Vermin Vunderbar. I give you this cake. Okay, maybe <laughs> the cake, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Um. The Doomsday Sanction, we actually figure out how Doomsday was was uh, 
was conceived. He's part of Cadmus, um, which is very awesome. It's very not comic, but okay. Well, yeah, but they had to make it fit with the show. One of the things I absolutely loved about Doomsday Sanction was the the rotating tables between the two camps. I thought that was a really cool effect. That was a really awesome shot. Yeah, it was. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and then Task Force X, uh, pretty much outsiders looking on the league, uh, was just amazing. Um, you know, seeing, well, you know, the one which surprises me, I, I can't believe this didn't happen, but the one bat villain that didn't uh, get hurt by the embargo, the Clock King. Clock King. They're like, we never use him anyway. Well, they used him a lot. Not a lot, but they used him for a couple episodes in Batman the Animated Series. But yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't like over. Yeah. Holy shit. He's not the Joker. He's not, you know, Penguin or any of those. But still, it was just, it was nice to see him make another appearance. Um, What did you think of just Task Force X overall? Oh, I thought it was nice. Um... God, it made me think of Secret Six and all of that uh, villains for hire, and it, it was just so. You, you had Deadshot, you had the villain centric part of the episode. It was just, I think that was definitely one of the highlights for that season. Yeah, it was. Um. Let's see. Then we've got the balance, which we find out how Wonder Woman got. You know, we we find out you know Wonder Woman's secret past that um, Hades is her daddy? father, huh? Who's the baby daddy? Yeah, really. Uh, the balance I didn't really care for. It, it's an okay episode, but it's not something I would go back and and watch on a regular basis. Now, double date. I love Double Date. That was awesome. I, I will say that I liked the balance. Um, um, for the fact that, you know, me being Mr. Greek Reconstructionist, you know, I, I loved what they did with Hermes. That was just spot on. Way to go. But, um, yeah. Mm. Double Date was awesome. Just for itself. Um, still... Mandragora just made me go, gah! <laughs> oh, I need to bring... Uh, did you ever see that Twitter yes. post I made yep. to you? The future of what happens to Mandragora's boy. Yeah. Ed, Edgar Mandragora shows up again in Batman Beyond, and he looks totally different between being a young boy and the adult Edgar Mandragora, but oh my god, it was so nice them seeing... And of course, you know, chronologically, outside of the, the the timeline, but chronologically, as the shows were made, obviously Batman Beyond was made before this. But I like how they were able to like the mesh the styles together between um, uh, young, uh, adult Mandragora and child Mandragora. I thought that was really cool. Uh, next up is Hunter's Moon, aka Mystery in Space. Um, which this is the Thanagarian wrap-up. Uh, we find out that Hrotalic died. Um, um, fuck, what tells his name? Krager is in some sort of bodysuit from what Jean did to him in Starcrossed. Uh, Perindul is the same bitch she always was. Um, <laughs> I will give Hunter's Moon one awesome thing. Nathan Fillion as Vigilante. And Gina Torres as Vixen. Right, right. But it was, a, it was a Firefly episode. Yeah, specifically um, Fillion as Vigilante. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and get this line for, for some audio when, when he's in the spaceship. Darn, darn <laughs> thing which no one can't get to work proper or, or whatever he said. Oh, my God, that that's hilarious. That's just so hilarious. Um, 
And then we have the four-part finale, which technically is a four-part finale, which is starts with Question Authority, Flashpoint, Panic in the Sky, and Divide We Fall. Uh, question Authority. Uh, just their version of the question, which is based off the Steve Ditko question, I believe, um, was just awesome. And Jeffrey Combs voicing him is just awesome. The bad part about it is it's not really bad, bad, but... Bad is good, today's opposite day, you know what I mean? Uh, but the, the funny thing about Jeffrey Combs is now he is voicing Ratchet in Transformers Prime. And all as I can hear out of Ratchet is, it's the question stuck in Ratchet's body. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, what did you think of Question Authority? The question is an awesome, awesome character. Yes, he is. Um, random show up of Mantis, and I'm like, what? <laughs> um, uh, overall, I think that these four episodes make up some of the best writing ever in any animated series. Yeah, this arc is so tight and and just so, so awesome. Like, they could put this into novel form and sell it, and it would be bestseller. It is awesome. Beyond belief. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> wasn't question? Yeah, question authority is when they interrogate him. A G L E T. Don't forget it. Yeah, uh, Aglets. No one really knows their true purpose. It is sinister. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Flashpoint. The uh, oh wow. Huh. I totally skipped over Clash. <laughs> it was that good of an episode. Uh, Clash is the, where they worked in Captain Marvel, uh, in, into Justice League and whatever. <laughs> I, I mean, the only really good thing about that is when Batman calls John for help, he's like, you need help? <laughs> You never need help. You never need help. Yeah, exactly. That that was really the only. Except when he's falling, because he can't fly. Yeah, <laughs> but that was really the only good thing about Clash. Uh, yeah, Flashpoint, that knockdown drag out fight between Soups and and Captain Adam was awesome. Uh, I, I gotta say, I didn't, I haven't really brought this up before, but Amy Acker as the voice of Huntress, and for those who might not know who she is, she was uh, Winifred Burkle in Angel. Uh, I'm sure she's done other stuff, but that's mainly where I know her from. Just her voicing the Huntress is just awesome. Um, and then Panic in the Sky. Oh, man. That episode had so much action and just great lines. So awesome. Huh? Oh, that, w- oh, that was really good. What? Uh, Panic in the Sky. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Batmobile lost a wheel. The Joker got away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's what? Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, when World's Finest Podcast covered Panic in the Sky, they had raised the question of whose hand it was that saved Batman when Lex knocks him out the window. Now, I've analyzed the picture of the League the seven when they come back up, because I, I I took a screen cap of all seven of them standing there. I analyzed that picture and I I took a screen cap of the hand that grabbed Batman by the cape, neck, whatever part it grabs. It cannot be Superman because the hand it does it doesn't it doesn't have a sleeve on it like by, by the wrist like Superman's sleeves come up to just just about to where his wrists are. So it can't be Superman's hand. It doesn't have a bracelet on it, so it can't be Wonder Woman's hand. Almost every other League member, Flash and GL, they both either have gloves or they have the, the, their whole arm is covered, so it was Hot Girl that saved Batman. Interesting. Yep. It was Hot Girl that saved Batman because she's the only one with short sleeves. Uh, and then Divided We Fall... Oh, man. Divided We Fall was epic. 
And not over the top epic either. It was just. No, no, no. It was just epic. It's very well done. Yes, very, very well done. Um, a lot of action. Great story. Um, Ghostbusters references, at least one of them anyway. Don't cross the streams. <laughs> When Superman and GL cross the heat vision in the, in the ring power to cut the Brainiac head. Th- and that, that's the other thing, Brainiac. Coming back and fusing with Luthor. Which will have ramifications in the later season. Yep. Oh, yeah. What about you for Divided We Fall? Honestly, I think the, the end, end speech was extremely powerful. Oh, yeah. Um, both by Superman and by GA. Yeah. Um, and then the whole scene where Wally basically does the sacrifice. You know, everyone takes him as doesn't take him serious, even Lex. And he shows what he's capable of doing, why he holds back, and you know that he is just as qualified to be on the tops in the original seven as Soups and everyone else. Yeah. And then. And the only reason why I'm talking about it here is because throughout the entire run of Secret Origins podcast, we've gone in episode airing order, however the episodes aired. Um, but epilogue is a great exclamation point or period on the DC Animated Universe. As I said earlier in the Season 5 recap, I would love to see adventures from Destroyer up until epilogue happens, that would be awesome. But epilogue itself, with Waller as the dotty old lady. She wasn't dotty. She knew exactly what she was doing. Oh, yeah. I I know, I know. Uh, Project Batman Beyond. (laughs) Um, She she didn't know what she was doing when she came up with that name, but... (laughs) (laughs) Um, but epilogue is just awesome. And the reason why I say that epilogue should go at the end of Justice League Unlimited Season 5 is because if you take the DC Animated Universe as a whole, uh, episode one of Batman the Animated Series, uh, on leather wings, the first thing we see is Batman flying by a chopper. We, well, we don't really see him, but we see the shadow of him. And, uh, the cops are like, what was that? And at the very end of Epilogue, you have Terry flying through the sky past a, 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 a Gotham police helicopter. So it kind of like bookends itself around it. Um, the fact that Terry and Dana have been dating for 15 years and, you know, Terry, uh, Terry finally told Dana the secret at some point. This is why I want a cartoon from Bruce, Tim, and them, like I said, that has adventures from Destroyer up till Epilogue. Because I want to know what happened throughout that time. Um, it would be so awesome to get that, but just epilogue was just epic. <laughs> that was a nice end off. Yes. And then we kind of already really covered season five earlier, but season five, minus the ones that we don't like, which is Chaos of the Earth's Core, to Another Shore, Dead Reckoning, Patriot, Patriot Act, Grudge Match, and Far From Home, all the other ones are just fluid storytelling. Uh, a lot of these other ones, like Chaos Theorist Core and all that, are uh, to me, they're just one-shots. If it doesn't directly affect the one of the main... Up. One of the original seven, it doesn't really... Mm, for me. Um, but just overall awesome. What about you? I I think you've actually covered everything. I mean, this is just... I've always thought of these not as... I, I, I thought this last season was kind of like the the one-shot-like side stories. Mm-hmm. Not like, oh, everything that happened, the continuation of the story, it just seemed like they're side stories, honestly. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it's background... F- Flushing for some of the ep- uh, the episodes like Ancient History and whatnot. Mm. Um, Grodd and his plan just turning everyone into monkeys. Really? <laughs> uh, what happens to Tala? 
the Return of Dark Side. Hmm. It just, I don't know. It was it was a great bonus. It's kind of like a bonus season, honestly. Yeah, it is. It it, it so is. Um, very very awesome. And to end it all, um, is uh is is destroyer and to me destroyer is very awesome it's not it's a nice exclamation point on the season i wouldn't say it's the best episode overall but it's right up there uh, at least for me it is it is right up with as as one of the best episodes ever um just really, really great. What about you? Um, You're kind of meh on Destroyer, so yeah, it, it was it was good. It just wasn't as epic as some of the other other episodes mm. we had prior. I mean, how can you really hold up in comparison to the last four of the prior season? Yeah, but it's Dark Side. <laughs> You know, yeah. Uh, I mean, it only two out of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, the last season it, it was Brainiac and Luthor. Now it's Darkseid, and technically Darkseid and Brainiac, because I, I believe I said this in in episode twenty four. You know, back in Twilight when the Brainiac uh, asteroid blew up, Darkseid was still on it, so he technically melded with Brainiac. So you have a dark Brainiac side. Uh, because his whole... His, <laughs> seriously! Seriously! Because you have... Darkseid has Brainiac stuff on his on his, uh, on his his outfit now. He's not just the navy blue skirt wearing mofo. Um, which is very, very, very awesome. Really quick, uh, before we go to the outro or some clips and then we'll go to the outro, I kind of want to go over some of the JLU, um, uh, line, the, the, uh, the toy line. Some of these toys are just awesome, awesome stuff. Wonder Pig. Yes, Wonder Pig. <laughs> um, one of the ones I'm a- absolutely looking forward to getting eventually is Mr. Terrific. <laughs> I just think that's awesome that he has a figure. <laughs> With the T-Balls. Yeah, with, well, they call it the T-Spheres, but yeah. Uh, Superman with Starro, that that was just awesome. Uh, the, um, let's see, what was the other one here? Uh, the, I mentioned this earlier, even though it's more Batman the Animated Series, the, the three-pack of uh, Batman, Joker, Grey Ghost. Um, my birthday is coming up on February 9th. If anybody wants to get me Darkseid and Calabac or the Parademon 2-pack, there's a Darkseid Calabac 2-pack based on Darkseid's based on his look in Destroyer or the two par- the uh, the Parademon 2-pack. You can find those at bigbadtoystore.com or you can find them on Amazon. I think Big Bad Toy Store is probably going to be the cheapest place you can find them at. I think they're $40 a piece, um, which is not bad for markup. Considering um, on MattyCollector.com they're twenty five dollars a piece, and I think they're sold out at this point on Matty Collector. I do have Lobo. Lobo's an awesome JLU figure. Um, he he was one of those oversized singles, uh, which is very very cool. Um, I think that's it for now. I think we're gonna go to some some of our favorite clips and lines and stuff like that, and then we'll come back with the outro. Okay, right, get into some episodes. Any minute now, Brainiac will explode. And guess what? You're going with him. No, Dark Side. To get off this rock, you'll have to go through me. You really are a glutton for punishment. Time and again I've beaten you, humbled you. What makes you think today's outcome will be any different? Because this time, I won't stop until you're just a greasy smear on my fist. Let's go. Give me a triple. <gasps> now. Adrenaline rush wearing off? Good. The doctor will see you now. Sorry. I'm going to have to cancel that appointment. Come 
coming here was the mistake of your life. See, the closer I am to someone, the stronger I get. I'll be able to go into your brain, even if you're wide awake. My brain's not a nice place to be. What's that stupid song going through your mind? It's what's keeping you out, Johnny. Well, before we get to the outro, um, something miraculous has happened. And even though in the outro I will have said, uh, leave us iTunes reviews, goddammit, apparently somebody did. <laughs> and it wasn't Lupus. It wasn't me. <laughs> uh, my buddy Godspeed from the TFW boards, he goes by Human Singularity on iTunes. I don't know why, but has left us a, uh, a review for Secret Origins here. The title is Like the Justice League, You Will Like This Podcast, and it is five stars, left on January 28th, 2011. Two mega fans go episode by episode through the whole Justice League cartoon from the early 2000s. A must listen for those just now pumping, uh, just now jumping on the Young Justice bandwagon. Check it out. So, thank you, Godspeed, for that. Thanks, Godspeed. Yes. And now, the outro to episode 25. Well, Lupus, that's it. Scary. <laughs> there should be more. Yes. Well, it did take us a whole year, even even with scheduling conflicts. It did take us a, a whole year to get this podcast done, which is, you know, is good for you know getting all ninety one episodes reviewed plus season recaps and and toy talk and stuff like that. But yeah, there's, no, there still needs to be more. Oh, I'm not disagreeing. As I've said throughout this entire episode, I want some sort of Justice League or some sort of DCAU cartoon that takes up where Destroyer left off and shows adventures from that point up till Batman Beyond. And then, you know, showing the adventures of Terry, obviously through the Batman Beyond show, but up till Epilogue. I want to see adventures from that point to that point. Um, it would be so awesome to get that again. Um, but just overall, I love Justice League. Justice League, um, I, I, er, earlier in this episode, I played that special feature, Unlimited Reserve, and in that, James Tucker, one of the producers, says that they never set out to make the greatest superhero show ever, but they kind of made the greatest superhero show ever. <laughs> what a happy little coincidence. <laughs> yes, exactly. Silly little side effects. Yes. Before I go into the outro, do you have any uh, parting words you want to give to the listeners and all that? I, I want to know what happens to the whole Vixen, Shaira, and John thing. Well, like, I don't know how that ends up. Bruce Tim has said uh, in the special features on, on the DVD, at, you know, we know sometime down the line that John and Shaira get back together whether it's two years, ten years, whatever, because they have Warhawk. So, but... I, I I would love to see an animated version of, you know, Cranky Shire Pregnant. Exactly. That would be so... <laughs> oh, God. The only problem is we cannot have Booster Gold and Skeets there to deliver the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Too true. <laughs> oh, but at the same time, what would she be craving? <laughs> uh, Those weird, like, are they oysters or are they something else? Probably oysters. Those oysters that she likes. Oh, God. That's going to take a long time to go grocery shopping. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a great run, and I'd like to thank all those people in the Ustream that have joined us. We, we've only been Ustreaming with Secret Origins Podcast, I think, since episode... Twin, episode 19 so uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's come out uh, Ken Curry thanks everybody yeah, Ken Curry Glade Packer Jamie Hannigan um, uh, Scotty Dew and, and Superfan Clark uh, so yeah uh, thank you to everybody who's come out each time that we've done one of these and um, for those of you who just joined us on Ustream I want you to go to iTunes for those of you who are in the US and Canada go to iTunes Subscribe to the Secret Origins podcast. 
And then leave us feedback. Damn it. <laughs> Somebody please leave some feedback. Yes. Uh, we podcasters, we live off of feedback. And honestly, we've been starving for a couple episodes. Uh, we've been starving for the whole damn uh, the whole damn podcast is what we've been starving for. I mean, we barely have any ratings on iTunes. Um, but yes, please go subscribe, listen to the entire show from the beginning, and we will go from there. Well, anyway, uh, yeah, so time for the outro. Thank you for joining us here on the Secret Origins Podcast. There are some ways to get in contact with us or leave feedback for the show. Visit the website, geekcastradio.com. Leave the show's feedback in iTunes. Please do this. You can follow us on Twitter. The show name there is Secret Origins. Mine is TFG and Mike. What is your Twitter? Caminetti Style. C-A-M-I-N-I-T-I-S-T-Y-L-E. Become a fan on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash geekcast radio network. Call the voicemail line. Tell us a show you're leaving the message for and your name. 502-526-5821. As far as voicemails for Secret Origins Podcast, if you guys are going to leave iTunes reviews or voicemails, what will probably happen is uh, Steve Megatron and I are going to be launching Legends of the Dark Knight where we talk about Batman the Animated Series and Batman Beyond and pretty much anything Batman-centric in the DC Animated Universe. Uh, So there will be a lot of Batman talk uh, coming later this fall, I believe, is when that show is going to launch. It's called Legends of the Dark Knight. Um, We'll be launching it then. So I think the Secret Origins feedback will probably be featured on that, and you and I, Lupus, can just record a separate segment that we can put into whatever episodes that that Steve and I do. So, um, But yeah, Legends of the Dark Knight coming uh, this fall from GeekCast Radio Network. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Secret Origins Podcast, and thank you for joining us on this journey. For now, I am TF2 and Mike with... Lupus Cowboy. Thank you for listening. And not until next time, but before we go, The Flash has something to say. I love you too. These are the end times. 